Again, think of what Saeed Abedini recently had to go through as uh, he was seeking to plant churches in, in the uh, Middle East and didn't like what, they, what he was doing, so they arrested him and he had to suffer several years in prison uh, for doing what he was doing, but I think if you were to ask him, he wouldn't have done anything differently. Uh, it was an honor to suffer on behalf of Christ. Well, let's see whether or not these rulers thought the same thing. Now, let's see, in, in verse 36, again, this is the beginning of this paragraph. This is what we read. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their hearts, so that they would not see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory, and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. So we see here, basically, not everyone uh, was rejecting Jesus. There were those who actually did believe. But even though they believed, they were doing something which obviously our Lord tells us um, we must repent of, which is hiding our Christianity for fear that we're going to be ostracized by men. We need to be seeking the honor that comes from God rather than the honor that comes from men. Now we saw this morning that um, even after all that Jesus did, they still didn't believe in him. The Jews didn't believe, even though they had all these reasons to believe. Even though he had done so many miracles, even though they had seen those miracles, eyewitnesses, even though Jesus is obviously the greatest preacher who has ever lived and could communicate the gospel perfectly and even communicated that good news that it was predicted in the Old Testament that, that the Messiah would bring, they still would not believe. But if you were paying attention as I read through this passage, you will recall we also saw why they didn't believe. It was because they couldn't believe. The Lord had blinded their eyes. The Lord had darkened their understanding. And remember, it was as an act of judgment against them for their sins. Now, we were very careful to distinguish the fact that God didn't create evil in their hearts, the evil that, that made them turn away from Christ, but he simply used the evil that was already there. The Lord was restraining that evil, but he pulled back that restraint so that their own sin would do its work. And remember, God doesn't... Uh, he's not required to give them that restraint to begin with. It's purely gracious. But the result was that they rejected Jesus. Now again, we saw why it is that had to happen. It had to happen. Otherwise, Jesus would not have been handed over to the Romans for crucifixion. And we would not have been saved from our sins. Jesus had to die. And he had to die at the hands of the Jews. They had to reject him. His own people had to reject him and cast him out. And that's exactly what happened. And again, this hardness, we don't necessarily need to see it as having continued, uh, at least in all of them, forever, because when our Lord was glorified and he poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost, I believe many of these Jews did repent and did believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus had to die, and so they could not receive him. Now this evening, John tells us that this judicial hardening that the Lord had brought upon them, this blinding from God, was not universal among them. There were also those who actually believed. And we've seen examples of that through John's gospel. We've seen that there were those who did believe, those who were following him, those who were uh, heralding him as the son of David, the Messiah as he came into Jerusalem and so forth. But we see in our text this evening that it was not just among the people 
but also among the Jewish rulers themselves. Even though outwardly it appeared as though none of them were believing in him, there were many, John tells us, that actually did. Now, John also tells us in the text why it is that, that it appeared that, that there weren't perhaps, there were just a few or perhaps none that believed in him, and it was because they kept their faith a secret, because they were afraid of the consequences of confessing the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, tonight, I would like for us all to consider that there is a very real fear that all of us have to face as Christians, particularly in the culture in which we're living. And that is the fear of what others think about us, what our Christianity is actually going to cost us. And of course, I'm hoping that as we uh, look at what it is that the Lord actually promises us, the honors that he has to bestow versus what you might obtain in this world, which you're not going to be able to hold on to, that you'll see the things that the Lord has to have to give are better are greater, and they're worth whatever it is you have to endure in this world in order to receive. So first of all, John tells us in verse 32 that many even of the rulers believed in him. And that is remarkable considering these rulers were members of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the governing body of Israel, the council. These were the chief priests and the elders, some of whom were Pharisees. They believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and as I've said, it's interesting that they did because these were the ones who, if they believed, and if they confessed Jesus and became his disciples, they were the ones who had the most to lose. Remember how Jesus said on one occasion that it's, you know, when, when uh, Jesus said that it's, you know, basically it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven, and the disciples said, well, then who can be saved? Jesus said, with men it's impossible, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. But why did he say that? Well, because the rich young ruler who went away, who would not become Jesus' disciple because of what it would cost him. Basically, everything. Jesus told him, sell everything you have, give to the poor and follow me. And that was something he was unwilling to do because he had made an idol out of his riches. Those who have the most to lose are the ones that are going to have the most difficult time following the Lord Jesus Christ. And that would certainly be true of these rulers. Now Jesus, or excuse me, John gave us an indication that even early on in Jesus' ministry, there were those among the rulers who actually believed in him. One of them was named Nicodemus, remember. Uh, John writes in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And I want you to notice from this text that Nicodemus was both a Pharisee and a ruler who had come to believe at least that Jesus was sent from God and since he believed that Jesus was sent from God and that Jesus was declaring himself to be the Messiah or at least doing the works that Messiah was supposed to do, that he was the Messiah. Nicodemus believed because of the miracles. But I also want you to notice that he uses the word we. Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. It wasn't just Nicodemus. There were others among the rulers, I would say presumably among the rulers, who also believed in Jesus. We also discover later, after the crucifixion, another one of these rulers who believed in Jesus, who was named Joseph of Arimathea, and I think you all recognize that name. Uh, we read in Luke 23, verses 50 and 52, and a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, he had not consented to their plan and action. A man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for the kingdom of God, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So even early on, there were some among the rulers who believed that Jesus was the Messiah and who actually were trusting in him. John tells us by this time in, in our passage, and remember that Jesus, in the time frame of this particular text is the final Passover, 
This is where Jesus is going to be betrayed. This is his final week. This is the end of his ministry on earth. By this time, John tells us there weren't just a few, but many of these rulers believed in Jesus. But I want you to notice, secondly, that they were keeping their faith secret because they were afraid of being excommunicated, being put out of the synagogue. John writes in verse 42, Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Uh, the particular verb tense that John uses here shows that this silence, this not confessing Jesus Christ, was not just something that happened perhaps once or twice, but it went on over a period of time. They didn't want to draw attention to themselves. <laughs> they didn't want their peers to hate them and to ostracize them. Uh, John tells us later on that this was certainly the case with Joseph of Arimathea. Remember, he was a secret disciple uh, in John 19, verse 38. Again, parallel to the passage we just read about Joseph. It says, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate, that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate granted permission, so he came and took away his body. Uh, Joseph believed, but he was a secret disciple, again, for fear of the Jews. The same was true of Nicodemus. On one occasion, Nicodemus even tried to defend Jesus uh, in sort of a roundabout way. He didn't say, I'm a disciple, and I think you're wrong, but he basically tried to defend Jesus from the law of God without declaring himself to be a disciple. This was so true of Joseph, true of Nicodemus, and true of others. It was true even before the Jewish leaders made the decision that if anyone confessed Jesus to be the Christ, that he would be put out of the synagogue, which we're told about in John 9, verse 22, which we won't read. Uh, even then, these men were still keeping their faith basically undercover because they saw which way the currents were flowing and they saw that it wasn't something that uh, would in necessarily enhance their relationship with these other rulers. And also in that particular example we have where Jesus goes up to the Feast of Booths and he's preaching. The Pharisees see it. And they send temple officers to arrest him. And then they return, these officers return without, without him and the rulers ask the officers, why didn't you bring him? Well, we read in John 7, verses 46 through 48, the officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? We see, as far as they were concerned, Nobody among the rulers or the Pharisees had believed in the Lord Jesus because they were doing a good job of keeping their Christianity a secret. So there were many of the rulers who believed, but they were keeping it a secret for fear of the Jews. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. But now we get to the real problem. You know, being put out was only, was only part. The, the real concern was what they would lose if that should happen to them. And that would be, as John tells us, the respect and the honor of their peers. This is something that apparently at this time in their lives they weren't willing to give up. Notice again what John says, particularly in verse 43. And this is basically verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, notice, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. You see, here's the problem. That's a problem basically we all have to face. They were finding it difficult to do what Jesus said they must do if they would be his disciples, and that is to pick up their crosses and follow him. To do that means basically to die to yourself, to die to your own reputation, to die what it is what you want to do. Face whatever you must face in following the Lord Jesus Christ, even dying for him. 
if, if the Lord should call you know, us to do so or them to do so. They love the approval of men more than they love the approval of God. They were more concerned about what their peers thought about them than what God thought. There was a struggle between their conviction that Jesus is the Messiah, they ought to follow him, and the sin and corruption that was still in their hearts. And this created, of course, that struggle that Paul talks about in Galatians uh, chapter 5, I believe it is, the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. So for a, a while, at least for a while, they wanted to hold on to both the good opinion of their peers and their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I hope you understand that there's some tension here. Uh, the tension is, does the Lord really allow us this option? And, and we need to explore that for a moment. Uh, the, the fact that they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God has, has led some commentators to, to believe that these rulers really didn't have a saving faith. They really didn't love the Lord and trust the Lord and, and were following Him. They only had an historic faith, which means they believed the facts. They believed Jesus was the Messiah. It was clear that He was, but they never really closed with Him. They never really loved Him. They never really trusted Him. They really weren't following Him. And, and that certainly could be a possibility. Jesus did say that one of the conditions of his confessing us or owning us in heaven on that day when we stand before the Lord is that we are willing to confess him here on earth, that we're willing to stand out and to stand up for him. We read in Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Now, we look at what these men were doing. They were not confessing him. Uh, we might say, well, by not confessing him, they were really denying him, and there is a certain sense in which that is true. But Jesus doesn't say here only that we must not deny him. He says that we must confess him before men if he will confess us before the Father. And he means by that, of course, not do this work, you know, do this one thing, obey this one command, and I will save you. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is, if you truly love me, you will be confessing me before men. That, that will be your heart. That will be your desire. Well, these didn't appear to be willing to confess him. Now, on the other hand, okay, we do need to consider these men were only human, right? They were subject to the same thing we're subject to, fear, uh, Christian imperfection, corruptions of the heart. Uh, we need to understand that we, they don't, neither do we, become mature Christians all at once. We don't grow up all at once. Growth takes time. Remember Nicodemus and Joseph. Both, I believe, are, are presented to us as those who believed. And yet, they essentially were doing the same thing. Uh, I think we need to assume that each time these men had the opportunity to confess Jesus Christ and they didn't, that it was grieving to them. Secretly, in their hearts, they were repenting. And you know what I'm talking about because we've all gone through this. Uh, I had that opportunity and I didn't take it. Lord, forgive me. We do the same thing. We need to be careful how harsh we are to these rulers, especially under the pressure, you know, the pressure they were under, which is, if you confess Jesus, you are out of the synagogue. If you're out of the synagogue, you are excommunicated from the religion of Israel. You are an outcast. You're basically a Gentile, uh, which was a very difficult thing to have to deal with. And yet, it's something the Lord tells us that we must be willing to do. So there was a struggle here with actually fulfilling the obedience that the Lord called them to. We do need to remember at the same time that there were men who right out of the gate, such as the disciples who were willing to pay this price, who left everything to follow Jesus, who weren't so concerned about what others thought, who were willing to identify with Jesus. And basically, even though they stood to lose everything that they had, even their own lives, they were willing to do this. Uh, 
they weren't even concerned about whether or not they were going to be thrown out of the synagogue because they were, there was this growing realization that the synagogue had abandoned God anyway. I mean, later in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus is going to say that synagogue has basically become a synagogue of Satan. They're not really worshiping God. They've rejected God's son. They've, they've rejected the gospel. They, you know, they're no longer a true synagogue. So let's not forget that the second example is the one that the Lord calls us to follow, not the example of the rulers. Uh, we wouldn't want to follow their example any more than we would follow David's example of committing adultery. Just because somebody who's a believer does something doesn't mean that we should always follow that example, if it's a bad one. And certainly the Lord does not commend what these rulers were doing, but still we recognize that they were believers and perhaps struggling. Now, what can we learn from these men? I think there's a lot that we can actually uh, learn from them. I think the first thing we need to learn from them is to be honest with what we see to be the truth. And here I'm thinking about their reaction to Jesus Christ. They looked at what Jesus claimed. They witnessed his miracles, or at least they heard eyewitness testimony regarding these miracles. They listened to him teach and, and the, to the truth he taught, and they concluded he was the Messiah. And so they believed in him. And again, they had their faults, but they believed in the Lord Jesus. Now, if you are convinced that Jesus is who he claimed to be, then you, this is what the Lord calls you to do, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the question that I would ask you first is, have you at least done what these rulers did, have you trusted Jesus? Have you received Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Are you following Jesus? You see, if, if you aren't, then you're not really being honest with yourself. You're not being honest with Him or with what it is that you know to be the truth. You need to stop riding the fence and you need to close with Jesus, come to Jesus, believe in Jesus, trust in Him, for eternal life. That's where it begins. But now secondly, having come to him, we need to make sure that we're not afraid to confess him, to confess him before the world. Now why wouldn't we want to do this? Well, maybe for the same reason they didn't want to do it, because there's a cost involved to confessing Jesus. It, it, there's a price to pay. There are things that we have to give up, and we know that there's a, a number of things that we may have to give up, uh, perhaps position, perhaps friends. People are being sued for standing up for what they believe. They're not willing to compromise what, what they believe their Lord is calling them to do, and so they're having to face lawsuits, and they're losing, some of them, everything that they have. But we do need to understand, again, um, something that these rulers needed to understand as well, and perhaps they did understand that Identifying with Jesus, that confessing Jesus is not an option that we either do or don't do. It is basically a command. Now remember we saw earlier in Matthew 10, verses 32 through 33, Therefore everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Now again, it's not enough that we simply don't deny him. And I, you know, again, I do think that there is perhaps some truth of the fact that if we have the opportunity to identify with Jesus and we clearly choose not to do that, to cloak and conceal our Christianity, that in a certain sense we have denied him. But Jesus is not saying just don't deny me, but he's saying confess me. We need to confess him before men. Jesus says, if we do that, he will confess us before the Father, by which we have to assume, we have to believe, that if we truly have the Spirit of God in our hearts, that is what we will want to do, and that is what we will find ourselves doing, though imperfectly, though perhaps weakly at first, we will do it. And when we fail, we will repent. Uh, we'll repent immediately, and we'll pray that God will give us the grace and strength to do it better the next time. Okay, secondly... If these pressures that are causing us to want to deny Jesus, if, if they really are something that we want more than Jesus that would make us either not confess him or deny him by the way we live, such as the approval of men, which is what these 
rulers were having to deal with, the Bible says that that is an idol that needs to go. I mean, again, the problem with these ruling believers, or you know, these believing rulers, I should say, what was their problem? Well, it was again in verse 43. They love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Now, whenever we love anything more than we love God, that is idolatry. And idolatry, this is clearly what the Bible says, is one of the reasons why God actually gives men over to judgment. I mean, that's basically what Paul is referring to in Romans 1, verse 25, where talking about why mankind is in the condition that they're in, one of the reasons he gives is this, for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Now, idolatry doesn't always come in the same form. It's not always in the form of a statue or you know, an image of some creature and we say this is a God and we bow down and worship before it. Idolatry can also come in the form of devoting ourselves to something and loving that thing more than God. So what if you love the approval of men more than the approval of God? Aren't you worshiping the creature rather than the creator? So we need to be careful because this is idolatry, could be the cause of the problem. Fear can also be the problem, of course. We need also to believe that the honor that God has to give us is much better than the honor that the world could possibly give us. You know, if, if they had loved God's approval more than they did, this would have made them bolder in their confession. I mean, would you, would you agree that's the case? I want to honor God. I know that confessing Jesus honors him, so I'm going to stand up and I'm going to own Jesus Christ. I'm going to confess him. But that wasn't what they wanted. They wanted the approval of men and the desire for the praise of men here is really one of the most powerful pressures that Satan can apply to keep us from confessing Jesus Christ because we want people to think well of us so that we can get ahead, so we can gain more of what the world has to offer. Well, again, we need to see this. Anything that we might gain in this life is something that we can only enjoy in this life. Anything we gain here, we are going to lose someday. Any fame that we get, one day is going to be forgotten once we're gone. And even if we happen to be one of those towering giants in human history that are still remembered from way back when, when this world is destroyed and everything in it, all the memory of that is going to be gone. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, I'm thinking of people way back there, you know. Uh, whether famous or infamous, they will be forgotten. Anything, of course, that we gain in this world, when we leave this world, we have to leave behind. So what use is it? Not really, not much. Some spend their whole lives chasing after these things, honor, fame, wealth, and they get nothing of it to begin with. I mean, they may waste their lives and still not get that, and yet they've wasted all the time they have to do what really matters, which is store up treasures in heaven. You see, the approval of the honor that comes from God is much more valuable because everything we do for Jesus while we're here, and remember here is, is the only place that we read of in Scripture that we have the opportunity to do, you know, to do the things for Him. Uh, we get rewarded for those things in heaven, but we're not told that there are other things to do in heaven that we get rewarded for. But the things we do here will be honored by Him, will be remembered forever by Him, and we will be able to enjoy the reward for for the rest of time. They will never, ever be taken away from us. Remember what Jesus says, don't store up treasures for yourself on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal, but instead store up your treasures in heaven where you know, moth and rust can't corrupt, thieves can't break in and steal. You get to keep the things that are in heaven forever, but... It's only the things you do for the honor of Jesus Christ and the glory of God on this earth that you will be rewarded for there. Now, we have to believe that that's true and be willing to give up what we can see with our eyes 
in order to gain something we can only see now by faith. But one day we will see with our eyes. We have to believe it. Otherwise, it's not going to have any effect on us at all. Only the things we see will have an effect on us, and so we will continue to go that direction. So we have to believe the honor that God has is real, and we have to believe it's worth more than whatever the world has to give us. Now third, the example of these men show us, thankfully, that when we fail to confess Jesus in the way that we would like, that there is grace, there is mercy, there is forgiveness. If we find ourselves hiding our lights under a bushel, if we find ourselves secretly confessing um, you know, our sins, as it were, because of our failures and repenting and praying that the Lord will help us to be bolder next time, if that is our experience, you know, we, yes, we, we did fail, but we repented and we confessed and we asked forgiveness. We know that, there, that we are forgiven. We know that he will forgive us. And he will help us to do better. He will strengthen us. He will help us overcome our weaknesses so we can do more of what the Lord calls us to do. Now again, we need to make sure we don't use the fact that God will forgive us as an excuse for our sins. Um, one person told me one time, confessing Christian, you know, that um, being in a difficult situation, somebody accosted him and attacked him, was going to beat him up and he said, well, he, he just denied Christ, realizing he could always ask forgiveness later and God would forgive him and he can just move on. We don't want to have that kind of attitude. Uh, Paul tells us that we shouldn't sin so that grace may abound. We need to resist sin. Uh, we don't use grace as an excuse for sin, but rather we are comforted by the fact that when we do our best by God's grace and we fail, that there is mercy, there is forgiveness to help us get up and go again because God is not going to abandon us. He will forgive us. And then fourthly and lastly, it reminds us that there may actually be more believers in the world than we think. And I think that's encouraging. John said here that there were many rulers that believed and yet it didn't, wasn't apparent <laughs> to anybody that they were believing. Um, I mean, the Pharisees and the rulers seemed to miss it. And I, and I wonder how many of the believing rulers were even aware of how many among them actually believed if they were all keeping their faith secret. You know, I'm reminded of that, um, well, of what happened, I think, uh, you know, during the time of uh, Second World War, Hitler and, and his, his leadership. There were a lot of Germans that hated Hitler. And, and they, they wanted to do away with him. They wanted to get him out of power, but they were so afraid of saying anything about it because they would be lined up and shot in a firing squad. So I wonder how many were all assuming that everybody was on Hitler's side and perhaps the majority of people actually weren't, but nobody was willing to confess it because they were afraid of what might happen to them. Well, that's exactly what was happening here, wasn't it? You know, Elijah lived during a very difficult time. And... He thought during his day at, certain, at a certain point that he was the only one left. And he was praying to God, Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've torn down your altars. I'm the only one who's left that's faithful to you. And then we're reminded that God revealed to him that there were 7,000 who had not caved in and bowed the knee to Baal. Were they all hiding somewhere? You know, that Elijah didn't know they existed or were they scattered throughout the people? And they were keeping their faith somewhat secretive because to reveal their faith would be to be executed. And there was no sense in, in just lining up in front of the firing squad for no reason. See, the fact is, we can't always see the people who are faithful because of the fact that sometimes it's, it's hidden. So perhaps if one or more of these rulers had taken a stand, they might have discovered that there were more of them that believed than they really thought. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the majority of them did, and they really didn't have to kick anybody out of the, of the synagogue. Uh, I don't know. But one thing we do know, that as we step out in faith, I think we'll find, as we make our faith known to others, that we may find there's more Christians around us, perhaps in our neighborhoods, perhaps in our workplaces, or in our cities, than we first thought. Certainly, we hope and pray that that would be the case. But we're not going to find out unless we're willing to stand up and own the Lord Jesus Christ. So may he give us the grace.
to do that. Let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and ask that the Lord would apply what we've heard uh, to our, our lives, our hearts this evening.